Ooh, I am the ghost of post-processing, and apparently Sen did not start his recording until 45 seconds into the show. You now return to your regularly scheduled programming. I'm Pixie. And I'm Pyrosin. And welcome to Nerd Talk. Today, all of us actually managed to go see Batman. Woo. Well, time. Jeff had already seen Batman a long time ago. Silly Sen having his life together. Being able to do things. So wait, Sen, did you go see it twice then? You make it sound like I was in it. Yeah, she was playing the Catwoman role, naturally. I am not Anne Hathaway, though I wish. <laughs> Wouldn't that be like a secret identity twist? So, despite my best efforts, I did not manage to get The Dark Knight Rises spoiled for me at all. Like, I was still totally surprised by all of the twists. Even the big one that Jeff explicitly spelled out last show. I, yeah, I didn't no, no, I'm read sorry. into it. Like, just being a comic book fan spoiled everything in that movie for me. The okay at the very end, the Blake turns out to be really named Robin, and that yes. was kind of cool. But I'm not sure Robin is the right character for Blake to have been. Uh, Blake should be Terry McGinnis from Batman Beyond, because Robin always works alongside Batman. Terry McGinnis is the replacement for Batman. Well, remember the Christopher He's... Nolan universe doesn't really follow any of the rules of the comics, so it it can go wherever it wants. Having Batman be, or uh, Robin be the successor to Batman is totally a valid choice. So you you pretty much told me straight up that Miranda Tate is Talia al Ghul last week, right? Yeah, that should kind of be revealed the moment she says the line, like, keeping the balance. That's like, oh, hi Talia. Welcome to I the movie. I totally missed that. I, I did not somehow... Right when that happened, when she explicitly says, I was Talia al Ghul, that I was stunned by it. Alright then. Like, I actually didn't figure out that the small uh, androgynous child in the prison was uh, Talia. Like, I actually thought that was Bane the entire time. Uh huh. But then when they were like, oh no, that, that was Talia, I was like, okay, cool, we're taking a cool twist with this character. That That's nice. But, like, I, I knew upon looking at Miranda Tate's character that, oh, that, that would be Talia. The thing about Miranda Tate is that she did not look terribly muscular. She was, like, she looked like a business person, and pudgy and soft, and not like somebody who would have climbed out of the Lazarus Pit by herself. It had kind of been a number pit. of years since then, I imagine. I guess so. Still, she was able to leap from a uh, from one moving vehicle into another. Rather effortlessly. True. Although that that came out after we'd already been told she was Talia Al Ghul. All yeah. before that, she seemed like a like a business person. <clears throat> yep. A softy. So, Liam Neeson played Roz Al Ghul. Yep. Yep. I the totally whole time. forgot about that too. Did, Batman that was Begins kind of was the a long part time of ago. The joke that Liam Neeson trained Batman. Why would you kidnap his family? <laughs> 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 That's pretty awesome. I'd never he heard that joke, but well, the, the, there's more setup to the joke in that he punches wolves in the face and adds adds all the other things that he's done in his other action movie roles. But yeah, throat chops. Did you think Taken was a good idea? I I still kind of think I like what they're doing with Taken Two a lot better than uh, than I imagined it was going to be. I, I imagine Taken, Taken two, 2 is going to be, hey daddy, I'm going on vacation go. again. Is, okay, is, don't get kidnapped Batman, this time. Obi-Wan, and the image is still loading. Curse you, slow router. <laughs> we'll just what cut could this. possibly be the plot of okay, Taken 2? Does go. he get his family kidnapped again? Uh, yes, they come back for revenge and they kidnap his wife. Yes, which I'm... makes more sense than in another completely random group of people unaffiliated with the first group <laughs> just has just kidnapped his daughter. Yeah, Liam Neeson's family. Liam Neeson family. trained Batman, Obi-Wan, and Darth Vader. He is both Zeus and Aslan, making him a god in at least two religions. He also punches wolves. Why would you try to kidnap his family? He is Qui-Gon. I had forgotten he that he played Qui-Gon. Qui <laughs> That's amazing. 
Liam Neeson is pretty cool. I am going to give you the link for that macro and do with it what you will. Really? No one's going to put that he... Wait a minute, I can't remember. Schindler's List, was he helping the Nazis or fighting the Nazis in that one? I don't remember. I don't remember either. I yeah, I want to say I want to say he was fighting the Nazis, but that could come out really wrong. So maybe I should look this up. Otherwise, it's going to be a Sen looks like an ass moment. Uh, yeah, Liam Neeson. He was Oscar, Oscar Schindler, Schindler, so okay, yeah, perfect. So he's the good guy. There we go. Who was the bad guy? God, I can't remember. The Nazis. No, there was one specific <laughs> like Uber Nazi. Just in general, <laughs> Hitler was the bad guy, Jeff. Yes, Hitler. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't. Actual not Hitler, that. played by Hitler, IRL. I couldn't not. Seriously, do that. we dug him up, tied. So, or no, we can't dig him up because he died with uh, burning in a ditch with petrol on him. Never mind. <laughs> died in a ditch covered in fire, so there's that. That's <laughs> a thing. That, that's my Eddie Izzard impersonation. There right you there, go. It's terrible. <laughs> like Pixie, all my impressions are. Not British. So my actor recognition is apparently really weak, because I knew that I knew the person who was presiding over the mock trials, but I wasn't able to figure out who until you I looked it up. You figure out that it was Scarecrow? It's, it's Scarecrow, <laughs> obviously. I, I was like, I know that I know you. I know that you're from the previous movies. I know that you're a character. I just, without the volleyball on your head, I couldn't figure out who you were. Well, it's it kind of sucks that you could tell that that role was, if they did write these movies previously... That role should have been Heath Ledger's Joker. Just sitting up there holding trial over over the Gotham elite. Like, that should have been the Joker there. Admit it. Yeah, but when Scarecrow Joker works, Killian Murphy has a wonderful sense of humor. He, he portrayed that perfectly. It's just the other villain would have fit better. I don't know that that would really work, because would Joker ever play second fiddle to anybody? No, but then again, Killian Murphy's character wasn't really playing second fiddle either. Because, I mean, he flat out yeah. said, Bane holds no sway in this courtroom. This is justice. Yeah, but that, that both of those things are lies. Yeah, Bane sitting in the background just like, hum dum Dude's thrown on ice. Do you... And if Joker was around, Joker would never let the nuclear bomb actually be an issue, because it would not be okay for Joker if everybody just died. Everybody has to be alive so that they can be tortured. Oh, yeah, that is a good point. So, other character motivation I didn't get at all. Why would Bane disobey Talia and try and kill Batman if his character motivation the whole time was that he was in love with Talia? Too much of a risk, I imagine. I guess. She wasn't going to know seemed... anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I guess not. It, admitted, they were she all going, going to be wrong. annihilated in, like, five minutes. By the way, spoilers? So. <laughs> I, th I think we've covered that. Spoilers. Yeah, like, huh, so, we're all going to be nuked in five minutes. Uh, I suppose I can kill you. Just for old time's sake. You'd think Bane would have just been like, wait, I broke your back. That doesn't get fixed. The other kind of character motivation thing I'm a little... real hard. I don't know. <laughs> All of the bad guys in the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy are basically just anarchists. They're not yes. really in for mm -hmm. anything other than torturing and killing people. But those are their whole goals. Well, in the second Which... movie we did have a range of more level villains, but admit it, those are all the very minor villains. Because Batman can deal with those in uh -huh. a sane way. Those are the, oh, I take away your money or I arrest you and suddenly you're not a big deal anymore. Like, it, it's the anarchists who are always the big villains. Uh-huh. Well, that's kind of the reason I disagree with you last week, that you said Bane is really boring. I, I thought Bane was super interesting in that he's the only person who's not just an anarchist. He was... I liked the idea that he was in it for the mercenary code at the beginning when he was still working for the other corporation, but then right. that turned but aside. But then he went just And then I liked, him, I liked him being a, a like, Snape to Talia. I liked him just being, like, a, a lovesick puppy, because that's, 
that is another thing that is not just straight up anarchy. But then he was just gonna disobey Talia and kill Batman, and that didn't make any sense. Hey, sometimes you just have to try to kill Batman. <laughs> sometimes you do, and then sometimes Catwoman has to shoot you in the face with a rocket launcher. Well, well, I mean, at that point, it was known that Talia was going to die anyway. Yeah, they were uh -huh. all dead. Everybody so, was like, gonna die. Yeah, I don't know, Bane taking a little personal to pleasure. Her, to keep her alive no longer meant that. Right. Yeah, it is true. You'd think they would have had some kind of grand escape plan so that they could continue the uh, the balancing in other cities. Like, just letting themselves die there didn't make much sense. Well, Particularly... if this were not quite as realistic of a Batman universe, then Talia's escape plan should have just been to be immortal. It's like, whatever. I'll just take a nuke to the face and walk away. But obviously, this is way too realistic a universe for that. Right. I mean, I'm frankly really glad the uh, subject of the Lazarus Pits never came up. Because yep. if it was literally Liam Neeson shows up and is like, oh yeah, we haven't got this pit thing, I just submerged myself in it, and I'm totally fine all the time. That that would have just completely broken the reality of a world where, you know, there, there's this flying zero-point movement uh, attack aircraft where every odd old building seems to just have a massive cave with unlimited super tech built into it. Like, you can, I was, honestly I was can't tell me by the geometry. Built all of that stuff. Yeah. That, that, that there's a scene no where Batman sense. is talking to Lucius Fox. And Lucius Fox is like, okay, we have this military lab that I didn't tell anybody about. And they go through his bookcase, and they're there. And they're, like, on the 50th story of a high-rise building. And then Bane is in a sewer with water everywhere. And he blows up the roof, and they're in that same military lab that used to be in a high-rise? What's the deal with that? Yeah, I'm but... kind of confused as to how most of that stuff got built. Like, you watch the end sequence where uh, Blake is walking into the new Batcave, and it's like, Bruce, how many contractors did you kill after they finished helping you build this place? Yeah, that, that was my thought when he gets his augmented leg, and he kicks, like, just a pillar, and he knocks some bricks out of it. And it's like, well, it's either you or me, Alfred. We're gonna have to put these bricks back in and mortar them in, because nobody else can come and know about this place, so... Yep. Uh, I, I guess I'm making I've a trip got dudes to Home to Depot. Beat up, so have fun at Home Depot. <laughs> yeah, considering someone expresses surprise when Bruce opens his own front door, yeah, that probably got settled on Alfred. <laughs> Yeah, like... Someone goes, you answer your own door? Yeah, I especially found that interesting that it... Who was it in that scene? Was it, uh... That was Gary Oldman in that scene, wasn't it? No, I think it was the, the cop Robin Oh, dude. Blake. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am kind of sad that Morgan Freeman didn't have more of a role in this one, apart from, hey, I've got some exposition for you. I'll be in this corner now. <laughs> there was a pretty good scene when they're flooding the nuclear lab and he's like fuck and then he's climbing the ladder to get out of the flooding nuclear lab was there actually ever any follow up on that no they, he, just, they, they just flooded the lab they flat out said that yeah this will bury it and no one will ever be able to get down here again it's okay, like you guys cause... don't have a wet dry back Just want to see a picture of Batman shot backing out the nuclear bunker. Lucius Fox was under the river, and then Talia al Ghul floods the lab, and Lucius Fox is like, I'm gonna climb this ladder, and then the camera cuts away, and we never hear anything more about it. Oh, I guess he no, shows he up totally at the funeral. he totally got out because he was at the funeral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Which, I'm so sorry, they just sort of skip the details of that. You would figure Bruce Wayne's funeral would have had more attendees than his butler, the... Uh, commissioner of the police and uh, and the guy heading up his company. You you would think we'd have more people. You would think that. An obvious there there were probably two funerals. We can assume that there was a public one and a private one. You would hope so. 
you know, he's kind of only known as one of the most important people in the city. Nobody likes him that much. No, everyone obviously really liked him, because he kept getting, like, harassed by that photographers every time he showed up. <laughs> Although, I will say, his invention of the EMP wristwatch, I totally want one of those. I, got, I wonder, there's the scene where he shows up at the charity fundraiser, and everybody is like, it's Bruce Wayne's first public appearance, holy crap, take a bunch of pictures of him. And then he hits the EMP and destroys their cameras. Did he destroy the pictures they already had? And did he destroy all the pictures they already had? Because that makes him a super dick, because he's just like, no press coverage of this charity fundraiser. Nope. Just be... And it's not even like he was keeping it secret that he had returned to public life. He was just like, I'm going to ruin your cameras. <laughs> He's Bruce Wayne. He's kind of a dick to begin with. I'm going to ruin your cameras and your coverage. Or, although, he's, no, uh, he's maybe just, I'd like... He's just so self-centered, he can't fathom a world in which everybody else can't just buy that with pocket change. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the alternative is I like to imagine that he's so good that he had an EMP device that merely disabled their cameras and deleted the pictures of him and not the other pictures. That is a hell of an EMP. A smart it's AMP. pretty sophisticated. Yep. It purposely scans for pictures of Bruce Wayne and deletes them. This is what we call the sex tape cleaner. So, the scenes with Catwoman totally being Black Widow with her manipulative uh, facial expressions and acting like she's panicked were super cool. Uh, not obviously as cool as Black Widow, but I think they were augmented by the fact that we had all seen the Black Widow scene. I don't so know, I honestly, like, oh. I think I liked Catwoman's performance in that sort of role a lot more than the Black Widow's. Well, like, the... With, with the Black Widow, you know she's doing what she's doing for... Uh, shield. You know, she's doing it for her employers. Catwoman is her own employer. She is self-employed. She's doing all of this using all of her tools just for herself. Right, and I totally like that aspect of it better, but the thing that was amazing in the Avengers is that, that the audience was being tricked as well. And yeah. it was pretty convincing for the audience. I agree. You you knew for a fact every time Catwoman was putting on a performance that she was doing it to get out of a situation. No. I I really did like the subtext that they put in this movie of the, the class warfare. Uh, that was really awesome that Bane hid his uh, little revolution behind the pretense of the poor versus the rich. It was definitely interesting. I was a little confused by it because, I mean, the good guy is obviously super rich. I what The idea of the actual Occupy movement is not that poor people want to kill rich people, and anarchy is not the goal of actual people who are trying for social change. The goal is oh, to no, make everybody rich, not to make the that. rich people poor. But this right, is right the... so... Rich people clutching pearls, basically. Uh huh. Well, it seems like the odd the movie, The Dark Knight Rises, is kind of pandering to an audience that doesn't really understand the concerns of the Occupy movement. Because I mean, obviously, the Occupies are, are not anarchists. Um. Yes, They're... but also they kind of make for the clear and obvious antagonist to Bruce Wayne, who is the one percent. Not anymore. Right. Halfway through the movie, we fixed that. Apart yeah. from the fact that he's still got all of his awesome toys. Yeah, he got to keep his nice big house and all of his stuff, basically. I mean, yeah, but oddly enough, they turned off his power. <laughs> and yet they let him keep like all of his furniture and everything. No, no Repo Man shows up. Right. For his stuff, not his organs. <laughs> his genetic code. Yeah, I, I now just want to see the Repo Man, like, knocking on Bruce Wayne's door. Like, hey, I know you've got that new cartilage. D could we need it back. Please. Uh, also, I know this seems like a silly thing to get hung up on, but... Why why was Anne Hathaway rocking, like, that long sheet of very doll-like, straight, parted, just-so hair? I don't, like... Even just adding some layers for length to give it, like, a little bit more sexiness, I think would have suited the role better than just 
the, like, all one length curtain of hair that she had. I don't think I have enough fashion sense to comment on this. Uh, well, she... you... Sen, you will have enough to comment on this. Link. She changed her hair immediately, immediately after, after she after finished filming, filming The Dark Knight. This, she got a pixie cut, which suits Catwoman woman more anyway, so why not do it actually in the role? You can't say that Obvious. it's not sexy, because I've just linked you to Anne Hathaway in a pixie cut in a bikini. <laughs> Obviously, there is a certain aspect of the Catwoman role wherein you want to pretend to be a socialite, and therefore you have to have a fairly conformist appearance. But I actually would have thought it would be pretty cool if there she had a wig, and there was a scene, and she was like, she walks out of the ball. In fact, there is the scene where she takes off her maid cuffs and collar, but then she should have whipped off, ripped off her wig, too, and been, like, just in those pictures in that link. Potential. But Yeah, and considering the, the new appearance of Catwoman always has her with short hair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it would have made sense to go with that. It's, the it's, rhetoric It is super hot and super in right now. Like, I don't know I don't get it. I think that would have been a better choice, but eh. Guess you can't be perfect. The rhetoric about Bane's revolution being for the ninety nine percent was all totally a lie. Because while he claimed that the people were in charge, the people were very clearly not in charge. Oh, yeah, Bane, Talia, a, and Scarecrow were in charge. Yeah, it, and it, so there, there was supposed to be that sense of betrayal. That yeah, throughout this whole thing, this whole revolution, claiming it's for the people, he's planning on killing all of these people. He's doing it as a complete and utter lie. And Miranda Tate, the the grand villain orchestrating everything, is very much rich at the time of these events, so the bad guys are still the rich people. Yep. So there is, like, this class warfare thing, but it's all kind of confusing. It's not very straightforward. So, okay, it's mentioned from a long time back, Miranda Tate had been funding this clean power project. Had this been, like, a super long game... Like, she intended all along to turn this into a nuclear rea or into a bomb? <clears throat> or was she just funding clean power just as a side project and it happened to be convenient? No, no, it... that would, uh, the, the fact that it was a bomb, it was supposed to be a bomb all along kind of goes well with the fact that, you know, you see her from the very beginning trying to get at Bruce Wayne. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you... you... The, the project to make the bomb was, or to make the energy source was five years old when the movie started. Like, they flat out said that this failed a few years ago and then Bruce Wayne went into hiding. Um, so I imagine the point where Miranda Tate comes into the picture, she's got the scientist, or she knows of the scientist who says he can make the bomb and wants to actually have the, the neutron reactor made so that they can manufacture this thing. Like, I'm wondering what her contingency plan was, though. Because, like, if Bruce Wayne had just gone, you know what, screw it, I'm not going to show her anything, I'm fine being broke. I'm just going to flood the reactor. Where does plan go? I have no idea. I mean, at that point, Bane is literally, like, sitting in a barn in a third world country just twiddling his thumbs, like, man, I wish I got orders today. Yeah, that would be pretty funny if... if... Batman floods the reactor, destroys the bomb, and then there's the thing where Bane traps all the policemen in the sewers and breaks all the bridges. And then the army just flies in in their jets and cleans things up, and it was like, well, that was kind of straightforward. <laughs> then we rescue all the cops from the sewers, and great. Yep, we're fine. Don't need Batman. Mistakes were clearly made at some point. Clearly. But this this movie was really good. I was pretty yeah. excited when they the ending. They let you thought they let you think Batman is dead for quite a while. Actually, there was a uh, a giveaway which Christopher Nolan always puts in his movies. The uh, the last time that Wayne and uh, and Lucius talk about the jet. There's a specific line Lucius says where he's mentioning the autopilot again. 
And Wayne gives a tell like, autopilot? Oh. Like, you could clearly tell what? that he'd already fixed it. Come on, this is bad. No, but... Oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. That totally was there. And it was pretty obvious. Yeah. Bruce, I didn't read Bruce it, though. totally gives it away. Well, that's pretty good. Yep. I'm, I'm a big sh- fan of foreshadowing and then long payoffs. And yeah. then and, the, and the no fact one's that this really was a three-hour movie allowed for quite a few of those, yep. including the scene in the cafe at Venice at yep. the very end. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, this was set up two and a half hours ago. The editing was really quite tight. I thought this felt like one of the shorter movies I've seen, even though it's one of the longer movies My in theaters. My one big issue with the, with the editing in particular is... There are those long jump transitions in the movie, like, five months pass between the start of the movie and the end. And there are times where, like, the movie will jump two or three months at a time in just And it's not specified at all. Yeah, no, like, we go from Bruce Wayne being left broken in the, uh, in Bane's prison, and then all of a sudden two months later has, uh, two months have passed in Gotham... And the only way we know that is, oh, there's snow on the ground now. Yeah, when you when you pass two and three months of somebody becoming super strong, you're supposed to have a montage with Eye of the Tiger playing. That way we know. Or, it, like, Christ- they could have just... Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you totally. They needed but... something there. Did you? I, I agree that that was very ambiguous. The micro counterpoint to that is that there were scenes in fights and the fight choreography of this movie was kind of strange because the fights between Batman and Bane they were just fucking throwing punches into each other there was no subtlety to it there was no martial arts it was I punch you you punch me and then I punch you again (laughs) but there was some things where they were moving around and then it's like Batman gets knocked off a scaffolding and Bane is following him down and they like cut like like 300 milliseconds at a time. There's just pe- periods of time missing from the fight sequences. The parts where they're moving around and nothing interesting has happened, they're just missing. So the fight happens in like this slight clip show fashion. I thought that was pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I do totally agree with you. I made fun of you, but I agree with you that those transitions are not well specified. Yeah, I, uh. the other big problem I have with the movie is during the first act, when Alfred at two different points is just, I'm going to fill in some exposition for those people in the audience who are missing it. Yeah, that that was the other thing, is there was there was a bit of exposition in this movie where they just alight. There's a character, and he's going to talk at the yeah. camera Alfred and explain what's going on. Alfred is talking to the camera and explaining why you should care between the two movies. There was quite a bit of that, but it was pretty well done, so that gets you a little bit of a pass, I guess. Yeah, like, the exchange between Blake and Gordon when uh, Gordon's uh, lie is revealed on TV, like, that was a good scene. That, that was good exposition, that was good emotion. Alfred flat out telling Bruce what he is feeling was not. You can't just have your characters say their emotions. That That makes makes me angry. angry. And I guess the the other thing I wanted to say is it didn't really feel like a three-hour movie except for the part where I needed to pee. (laughs) My other gripe with the movie theater system is it's like, I really wish I could pause this for like 90 seconds so I could go pee. This, this, I'd probably be able to pay more attention to this movie if I weren't paying attention to my gut. Again, this, this is why I thought Spider-Man 3 was actually a good film for like a year and a half. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, were you, did you miss the emo scenes? Um, I specifically went to, to the restroom. And I should preface this with the fact that I had had uh, uh, Mexican food prior to going to see the movie, like immediately prior. So this was already not agreeing with me. I missed the entire section of the movie with Peter Parker dancing and Peter Parker being an ass in the jazz club. Just completely missed those scenes. 
that would make that movie a very different movie. Yeah, so I when, mean, I lo- when I got back in the theater, I sat down and I was like, what I miss? And literally, uh, the person I went was just like, oh, some really horrible dancing. I'm like, dancing? What? I thought he was being sarcastic. <laughs> so for the next year, I was like... I, I am Spider-Man amazed that the person you talked to bad. was calm about that, because my reaction to those scenes in theaters was just like, what? What? What just happened? I don't know what happened, but it was crazy, whatever it was. And I I actually kind of liked Spider-Man 3 for what it really was. And that scene is Sam Raimi making fun of the idea of comics, making fun of the audience, and making fun of his own universe. And if you take it as what it is, and, and kind of are willing to play that way... It it's pretty funny, but yeah, obviously it is not uh, the same tone as the rest of the series. Right, they they completely abandoned whatever seriousness there was in that franchise when they made the third one. Uh, that got super silly and tongue in cheek and camp, but if, if that's what you wanted, then it was okay at that. No, most people went into that movie like, oh, my OMG Venom, it's going to be super serious and super cool. We may even get a hint of carnage. Nope. Nope. All right. Oh, well. Uh, That was a good movie. So, yeah. No, I, I had no problem with The Dark Knight Rises. Was it as good as the second movie? No. Does it make a complete trilogy and is pretty sweet. Yup. I feel like I would like to watch all three movies again in a, you know, less than five, ten year intervals sometime. I feel like maybe they might have a different flavor to them if I saw them all together. Mm-hmm. But... That's the, the... All of the movies are good enough that it is worth that. Yep. Other cool things... We landed a rover on Mars this week. We yep. being me, Pixie, and Sen. Not definitely NASA. It was Personally, us. we Personally. did it. That was it. The rover was named Giant Death Robot. We thought that was a good name. It has hear someone... I was going to call it the Geoff. We hear someone <laughs> else is sending a probe, but honestly our probe is kind of designed to fight their probe to the death. So Right, specifically... Our nerd, probe nerd is a counter probe Mars designed to destroy again. curiosity. That's why Mars is our private studio slash, you know, missile base. Which explains the delay between our shows. <laughs> yes, that's why it takes so long. Latency. It's because of space. Mm-hmm. The other rover that's on Mars is called Curiosity. And it's got also a nuclear a power reactor in it. Everybody seems it's to actually... have that last one. Yes. The buzz reactor are going to solve curiosity, aren't they? Look, we take building space probes the same way that we take building battle bots. It's not good enough unless it can eviscerate the other one. It's true. The other two um, rovers which I'm blanking on their names, but the ones that have lasted a long time and done a lot of cool stuff on Mars were powered mostly by solar panels. Curiosity is actually powered pretty much exactly by the nuclear reactor in Batman. It's got the the nuclear decay uh, heat source. It's pretty cool. It's the size of a car dropped by a sky crane. Sweet. Uh, We'll put some links in the description and video where you can see some pictures and find updates about the mission. I want I, I want to talk about this more than necessary because I, I think that as a species we should really, really be trying hard to go to space. Would, if we're shooting each other with guns, we're wasting our time, we should be going to space. What are we doing? It's our goal. Go to space. Space. Permanent human settlement on the moon. By the end of 2013. Ocean. I, I mean space. <laughs> I guess you could go to the bottom of the ocean if that was a thing. <laughs> Which segues perfectly into the new Mass Effect 3 DLC that was announced. Leviathan. I'm finding Which myself says... shockingly apathetic towards this. 
Which finds Commander I have not Shepherd heard word one about it. Into the ocean, actually. Into not the Earth ocean. Which that would be so ocean. It's an ocean, but ah. Um, looking for some like mythic super weapon to fight the Reapers, and uh, I think it's gonna be like ten bucks. Comes out later this year, probably holiday release. And try to figure out anything else that we know about it. Mass Effect 3 was a really good game, but I find myself chronically unable to actually play DLC. I mean, the there's a curve of playing a game where you have to learn all the controls and just sort of be in the headspace to think about the universe and stuff. And to go back in for like a two or three hour experience after you've been away for a while is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Especially when Steam sales are so prevalent. That you can just be buying AAA games for the price of DLC all the time. Just play a new AAA game instead. Like, my problem with the DLC in Mass Effect, like, I, I normally like DLC. I almost always go through and play it. My problem is your DLC is coming out for a trilogy that is over. You have the ending. Whichever one you picked, that is your ending. Adding more to it isn't going to change any of that. It's not going to change the story of how Shepard uh, fought the Reapers and finished it. True. I always thought the big myth of Mass Effect was by far the most compelling thing about it. And that's the reason I was satisfied with the original ending, is because it resolved the big myth. The, the important thing is that there's these fucking planet-sized crustaceans from outside the galaxy killing everything. And... To explain where they came from, why they're doing what they're doing, and what's going to happen as a result of them existing. Once that's all dealt with, that's what I was here for. Yeah. And so, this doesn't change that at all. Yeah, I, f I feel that my experience with Commander Shepard, with the Mass Effect universe, for now at least, is over. Adding more DLC to that doesn't change my opinion. It doesn't engage me the way I think EA and Bioware would like it to. And that, that's entirely the fault of it being the DLC on the end of the trilogy. Like, DLC for Mass Effect 2, I was always excited for, because it was like, oh my god, new stuff that's going to lead into the third game. Do stuff that could shape my playthrough leading into the third game. But now that I've finished the end of the trilogy... I'm like, okay, that's it. We're done. Well, I guess the other thing I would say is that if this is really Bioware, if you have the writers and the coders and the people, the creative staff responsible for Bioware games that we've all loved, such as Mass Effect or, Ni or Knights of the Old Republic or Jade Empire, then put them on a new original property. Get them started on the next big thing. We Mass Effect is done. Start them on the next thing. Right. These people need to be using their time as best they can. I don't know. Jade Empire 2 sounds pretty sweet right now. <laughs> okay, sign me up. I'll take it. <sighs> Give me Knights of the Old Republic 3 now that your MMO has gone to being, you know, free to play. It's not officially gone yet, but we should talk about that. Talk away, Pixie. Uh, so it's doing a thing that's kind of weird um but not okay not actually weird in that other mmos that have gone free to play have done this for example uh was it dc universe whatever the dc online mmo is yes yeah has a similar dc thing universe online where, is the name of um it. you do the subscribers get preferred treatment to the free to play players but you can technically play for free and you still get a lot of the pull so star they trek online on, actually has almost exactly this model and they had this on the 31st, so the day that we had the last show? Yes, it was a week ago today. Uh, so it was the day we had the last show. This came out, and we didn't find it until today, or last week. Anyway, so there's, there's a few perks that go to having subscribed and uh, using the free-to-play system. And... 
it's not coming out until this fall. So you've got a little bit of time to, I guess, make up your mind or whatever. And the way that they're doing this incentivizing thing is with this in-game currency, uh, cartel coins, that's only available, I guess, for people who buy into it. Kind of like IP versus RP in League of Legends, I think. But like, say for example, you get like these rewards for um, every paid month you were a subscriber prior to July 31st of last week, you get 150 of these cartel coins. Which are to be spent, I think, in a, yeah, for the purchase of uh, specific in-game items in this, um, in this market. They're all basically, basically aesthetic. The Lost Mask of Darth Nihilus from Knights of the Old Republic 2, A Meditation Throne, um, Vanity Pets. Looks like from the Facebook poll that Party Jawa is going to win the community vote. Party Jawa. <laughs> Party Jawa. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you, you basically summon him and he d d d d animates this little Jawa who's got balloons and he's getting his freak on. Anyway. <laughs> uh, let's see. Those of us who purchase the collector's edition get a thousand cartel coins. Um, and also a banner. Uh, let's see. A banner that tells everyone I've spent more money than you. <laughs> uh, that fan's choice item goes for everybody who is subscribed as of August 1st up until the free-to-play launch. Um, so party Jawa, probably, judging from the way the poll, the poll is skewed wildly in that direction. I don't think you can say the words party Jawa and not have it win a contest like that. Yeah, well, especially considering the other one is a hollow Rancor statue and the other one was a carbonite hibernation capsule. So it freezes your character? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a carbonite freeze animation. Party Jawa. Party Jawa. Obviously. 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 There's, there's no argument there. Uh, so I'm... 200 cartel points for uh, each month played from August 1st to the free-to-play launch. 250 coins for all active uh, players at launch, so that'll be even for the new players. Uh, there's also going to be limits on like certain stuff you can do like for example um certain operations and war zones and stuff stuff are only are going to be limited to subscribers only you're going to have full access to the story no matter what even as free-to-play characters uh subscribers are going to get stuff like um obviously priority in uh places in queues Fun thing, the free to players not allowed to press the I key. <laughs> the I key isn't bound to any actual functions in the game, but if you want to, you know, do the text chat, it kind of sucks. Yeah, you just can't by, use that button. But yeah. you're not allowed to. We don't mean that you press it and it does nothing. We mean that if you press the I key on your keyboard, we'll send electrical shocks to shock you. Yep. And close your account. Don't forget that. So. I like the model. It's a disappointment, obviously, that the Old Republic has been a huge financial failure for EA. But oh, enormous. The, the ability to play the class story for free sounds pretty good, because the class story is what I'm most interested in. But the fictionalization of it seems a little weird. That you're getting cartel coins for playing... It seems like if you're playing a Jedi, a light side Jedi, why are you dealing with the Hut cartel? They're nasty people. <laughs> but, okay, I guess that's just like a super minor gripe. Uh, the other thing is it seems like what they're really locking away behind the payment is um, the massively multiplayer part. It's the operations. And so it would and be the parts... war zones and stuff like that, yeah. So any situation where you have more than four people interacting with each other is what you basically need to pay to do. I guess this makes sense from a server costs perspective, because theoretically the expensive part of running the servers is having lots of people interacting at the same time. And if you only have one person off in a story instance by themselves, that doesn't have a lot of ongoing cost. There we go, here's the but, yeah. play. thank you. Um, there's also a breakdown of exactly, like, the benefits and stuff. Um, 
God, where is that chart? I, I'm dri gr driving myself nuts because it was very easily found before. This works great for me because Here I basically is, never want to play with more than four people at a time. It's okay, all free so for I'm me. I'm going to supply the link for an eventual link dump or whatever. But there it is. Um, you get full access to the story content no matter what. You're going to get limited access to character creation choices, and it's not specified what. Oh, it says some character creation options, such as species, are limited to subscribers. There we go. We've got more details now. So I guess certain races now are going to be off limits to you free people. That's weird. I am I'm sorry, human now. is for paying customers only. <laughs> that would be pretty funny. I, I'm almost certain that they wouldn't do that, but that would be pretty uh, gutsy if they did. I'd like, Sith would be for paying customers only. Stuff Probably. Like that. Those popular races. Let's see. Or rather, the, the lusted after races. Uh, uh, the popular ones are basically like Zabrak and Twi'lek I see a lot. Take I was going to say cyborgs. lusted after. You mean Twi'lek? Yeah, Twi'lek. But um, Tish. Twi'leks are always strange. Why do I have a feeling that the non-paying customers aren't going to have the quick travel uh, features? Let me get to that. Uh, You're free, correct. Free characters are going to have limited access to war zones, limited access to flashpoints, limited access to space missions. Uh, they'll have a weekly cap. Um... Uh, only subscription members can do operations, so free players will have zero access to those. Travel features. Subscription members have access to all travel functionality, making getting around the world easier. Uh, uh, in other words, no mounts if you're a free customer. It doesn't say that, but I don't know if they just give you, say, less taxi access or something, or maybe you've got... Longer like, cooldowns. Yeah, longer cooldowns. Yeah. Or, or maybe you get charged more for using the taxis. Who knows? I, I have a there feeling are no that details, like, the, but... the Galactic Fleet Pass is going to uh, to not exist for those players. It's also I possible think that just there's limited right. access there. I don't have any details. Uh, log in. Obviously, you get priority um, queue position if you're paying to be there. And you can post 50 listings on the auction house if you pay the fourteen ninety nine subscription, but you get limited access. It doesn't specify a number. Uh, if you're just using the free play bases. Yeah, the travel thing, it's that is the one thing that strikes me as Oogie, because the way I read that line, even without any details, is that the game will be less fun to play if you are not paying us money. It will just be inconvenient, and there will be more boring parts. Which so. makes sense to me, totally. Yeah, no, the, this is typically a thing. It is typically a thing, but it's not always a thing, because, I mean, uh, League of Legends, the free-to-play game we always go back to, is basically does not have any aspects that are like, the game is less fun to play if you don't pay us. It, it's all just cosmetic stuff that's a bonus on the side if you feel like it. The actual game itself does not have more boring parts. Even boosts are largely IP-based. You can't just buy a bunch of XP boosts with uh, RP to get to level 30 immediately. You still have to play the game a bunch. Yeah. My, my big issue with that is, like, you're obviously making this game in order to get people to pay for it. Like, that that's just what you do. Right? Right. So, when your MMO fails, basically going free-to-play like this is your the last possible step you can take of please let us recoup some of this money. Right. It, it's almost always guaranteed to fail. Pretty much. The list of successful MMOs right now is one World of Warcraft, Eve Online. Oh yeah, sorry, there's a couple. At, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm I, I'm being wowist. Um, yeah, World of Warcraft, Eve yeah, Online, that... EverQuest One. I can't say EverQuest Two with a straight face. So, 
It's pretty funny that EverQuest 1 is still, still active rolling. and well played and beloved while EverQuest 2 is not. Speaking of while we're talking about MMOs, I feel I should just mention um, recent release Terra has uh, launched a seven day free trial uh, of their game. Basically, oh. all, all you have to do is go to their website, uh, nmass.com, and enter. Uh, you create an account, and then when it says enter a code for a game, all you have to do is type Terra Trial, and it gives you the seven-day free trial on your account. That's a surprisingly limited amount of failure. I mean, even successful games, I guess, have that degree of trials. Yeah, but usually but... The, the trial phase doesn't start for some time. Like, if I remember correctly, Terra's been only out for like two months. In North America, it is a bit older than that in other regions, I believe South Korea, and it might even have financial success elsewhere. But right, I figure well, they will they will change their business model in North America, but yeah, they're primarily from elsewhere. Yeah, I'm giving it a try, because I thought this MMO looked really cool, apart from like certain characters' outfits. The, the game does do the, yep, female characters, as they get more powerful, are somehow wearing less clothing. Always, of course. I don't know. The, That's one the... thing I've thoroughly enjoyed about my Old Republic characters is they're not scantily clad. Unless you I... choose to make them because you happen to play one of the few classes in the game that can be fully functional <laughs> wearing the slave girl outfit. Well, any class can wear that is the thing. They can wear it. They're oranges. Oh, I'm sorry, wait. I can't wear that because I'm a male character and it doesn't appear. Yes. It will not show up on your character model. Right. I also desperately wish there was a way to, like, functionally make the male character model shirtless. I want to turn my companions into eye candy, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I just don't want to sacrifice all of his armor scores. He's so functional. One of the things I've said for a while... Especially when they've always got like, felt... that ugly mismatching armor thing going on when you're trying to build a good set. It's. I mean, thankfully with recent features you can now fix that because you now can color coordinate armor. Yes. So that that is a neat little feature. A noob's I, best friend. I, I do like that. Like, when I was leveling up my uh, mercenary, those features had just been added. And it's it was suddenly like, ooh... Suddenly my character doesn't look like raw ass. <laughs> Yay! As opposed to, like, finely sautéed ass. Finely sautéed ass. <laughs> Grilled, if you will. Pixie and I have lately been playing a fair amount of Saints Row the Third co-op, and that has felt to me like what MMOs are supposed to be. It doesn't have the massively multiplayer aspect, but one thing I've always felt has been missing from MMOs is character collision. Because it feels so unreal to me when the, you're in this, like, say, the Republic fleet, and there's hundreds of people walking around, and there's a person standing in front of you, and you don't walk around them. You just walk right through them, right. and the game is just too naive to do anything about it. Also, and playing have a tendency to stand, basically, inside of my character model during cutscenes. Yes, uh, the Old Republic in particular always warps people to the same spot during class quests, and so if you have four people in a party, there will just be four people inside each other, like Final Fantasy VII style. And in fact, in World of Warcraft, that was often a strategy that, okay, guys, th this thing's going to do some kind of AoE thing, so why don't we all just pile up on each other, and then we can all just shift around if the AoEs tend to stay. Like, you, uh -huh. you took advantage of that. Okay, I gotta say, looking over the Terra website right now, they're, they're currently having their summer event, which, uh, looking at the website, displayed this uh, event by showing a one of the female characters wearing a bikini. And I was like, oh, can see where this is going. And then I'm looking at the rest of it, and it's like, okay, everyone else of every other race and gender available is also wearing swimwear, including one of them in a mankini. <laughs> So at least we're being fair. Ooh. <laughs> yes, it does look like Terra was about 18 months old in Korea before it came to North America and right. had some degree of success there. So. Yeah, I'm going to uh, give it a yes. seven-day trial, so I'll be, I'll be good to report on it for next week. 
playing Saints Row the Third co-op, first of all, it's it had no networking issues. Pixie and I have been playing a number of different multiplayer games lately, and all of them have been super hard to deal with networking issues. Saints Row the Third has pretty much just connected right away without forwarding any ports or anything immediately for us. And then right. it hasn't had any lag after it's connected. You do get disconnected then, a lot, but I think that's your internet. Right. I, I have been disconnected from both the game and Skype and the rest of the internet, so can't really mark that against Saints Row the Third. But once you're in, you then have character collision. Like, I, I can't walk through you. I walk into you, and then I push you around. And then it's even, there's procedural animations of my character reacting to the fact that you're there. Does your zombie and character, like, spout that she's angry? We didn't have any zombie characters, but what? probably. <laughs> How do you play nope, Saints Row we all as had... not zombie? You didn't. <laughs> no, I played as British guy because it was awesome. Exactly, uh, and we played as the other funny accent. Both of us are playing as Russian Lady, and Russian Lady is pretty... It was actually kind of funny when we joined each other's game, and our characters had the same haircut and the same body types. It's like, oh. And the same ethnicity. <laughs> well, yes, it's just like, oh, I guess we think alike. I, I, ma I had, made her go get a hair change. <laughs> we had to go to get a plastic surgery shop and differentiate ourselves. <laughs> But then you can do karate moves in the world, and it's like, I can watch the other character doing these crazy animations from a different camera angle than I've ever seen it before. More That's signs all of synchronized just how awesome and... Saints Row the Third really was as a game. It is it's so pretty good. fun, and if you can pick it up, you should. I, I always knew it was pretty good, but I've been particularly impressed by how well the co-op works. It's just, it's so smooth and instantaneous. And it, it doesn't, like, give you any crap for what almost feels like cheating. Like, oh, well, I have to do all these quests and they're too hard for me, so why don't you come and you have, like, way more weapons than I do and it'll be way easier. <laughs> In the invite screen, there's just, like, a, a selector where it's, like, friendly fire, full, light, or none. Like, wh do whatever you want. I mean, whatever you want to do, have fun with it. It's it's just here for you. That, that really does seem to be the motto of the Saints Row series: just have fun. And I think that's fantastic. That that's what gaming should be. It shouldn't feel like a chore or a hassle or something to get angry about to play games. It should be: am I having fun? Yes. Then I will continue to have fun. Am I having fun? No. Now I guess I'll go do something else. So, uh, playing Saints Row Co-op has felt like an MMO. Except you have, like, lots of clothing choices, and there's character collision, and procedural animations. Like, why isn't there an actual MMO with clothing choices this sophisticated, and character collision, and procedural animation? I want it. Right. So, I'm thinking next week we're, we're going to be doing our Gen Con preview show. Seeing as, you know... <laughs> I have, like... We'll be actually at Gen Con come uh, Friday next week. Or two weeks from now. I have like three more games on my list, and I'll mothball most of them. But there's one thing I have got to say. Which I don't know how I failed to transition from the Mars rover to Red Faction Armageddon, the <laughs> game on Mars. You, you think that would have been an easy transition? <laughs> As you'd think. I, I, I whiffed it. Uh, but I right, also interrupted. Right at the very beginning of Red Faction Armageddon... There is a fairly standard scene where your character gets injured, and this happens at the beginning of every first-person shooter, and there's, like, an advisor character who's telling you how the camera controls work. And it's like, hey, uh, look up. This is just a tutorial section so we can tell you how the camera works. And if you move the mouse up, your character looks up. And if you move the mouse down, your character looks up, and it saves your controls as inverted automatically. Aww. And I was like... Mm -hmm. That is so smooth. And then right after that, it shows on the screen, it's like, your inversion settings have been saved. So it's like, you see what I did there? I did something clever. Appreciate it. I was like, yes, you did. I, I like, do. I was just like, if in that sequence where it tells you to look up, if you look sideways, does the game just go, yep, you're drunk? <laughs> it just turns the settings to easy, because it's like, oh, this is a dumb player. <laughs> They can't, they can't take hard enemies. Bad news, Ted. I think that this one's brain damaged. Put him out of his misery. And the NPC just shoots you and the game ends. 
<laughs> wow, that would be pretty harsh. <laughs> Actually, what it does is just that the left and right axis doesn't do anything. Uh, so it's just like a test of ask to look up where does his hand naturally go. Yep. Instead of making but, you fiddle with things, which I think is... I, I love when stuff like that is in, integrated seamlessly into the narrative and into the UI. Ah, this, this is one of those things that I really... Can I can I just take a moment to continue filleting uh, whoever at Rockstar did that notebook UI for L.A. Noir because it is beautiful. It is pretty good. Uh, I have two best. feelings about menus. One is that I want menus to be there and to have everything in them and to let me do anything. And then the other feeling is that once those menus are there, I want to never go into them and never use them. They need to be there, but I need to never actually need them. Hey, and do me a favor. So... Press space to say Apple. <laughs> that There's no way to say Apple. That's it's impossible. I I can't. I'm yelling into my microphone. Apple, Apple, Apple. Man, they totally should have built in microphone support there for one tiny gag. Would have been a ton of programming work. But <laughs> probably yeah, just taken months of QA testing. Put in text to speech or speech recognition. You can say Apple. But then you miss, like, your, well, you're obviously brain dead type joke from uh, <laughs> Queenie, yep. and that would have been sad. You have, that that have was a jump. Minor case of severe Let, let's brain try this damage. again. <laughs> a minor case of severe brain damage. Uh, the other thing about Red Faction Armageddon is that it is surprisingly a lot like Disney's Epic Mickey. This is the game with all the destructible terrain. And you blow things up with your guns, and then about 20 minutes in, you get a raid that reconstructs things. And Except theoretically, these in. Epic Mickey sucked, so. Right. Really so, Red sucked. Faction Armageddon is Disney's Epic Mickey if Epic Mickey was good and a first person shooter. Okay. So, basically, nothing like that. <laughs> so, now what you're making me want is Mickey Mouse the first person shooter. Someone get that on would that. be pretty great. I, I would like for Epic Mickey to not have sucked while we're making unreasonable requests. Yeah, Epic Mickey was not a great game. I, I'm fairly... It, it was I'm at the point the... where, Sen, I was volunteering to do your dishes to get out of having to play this game. <laughs> do I you did remember make, that? I did make you play that one, didn't I? Yes, you did. <laughs> Called in the Bayonetta card, finally. And I was like, please, I will wash your dishes. Can we do anything else? <laughs> nope. We reviewed that. Now there's a sequel was... coming out that we'll have to review. Oh, Sounds. no. I, I I don't think I'm going to go in for that. I was a big fan of Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, and that's why I went in for Epic Mickey, because it seemed like Disney had some sense. They had some people working for them, making sure they were making good video games with their properties. Apparently not. Right, well, part of the issue with Kingdom Hearts is they're great games, until you realize that, Epic wow, Mickey they, two they just Kingdom explained Hearts. to me that all I'm doing is grinding here. Like, the game just flat out tells me I'm grinding for 40 minutes. Epic Mickey 2 Ooh. comes out November 18th, by the way. So we're safe for Where does that happen? What? Um, specifically the, the part in Kingdom Hearts 2 where you're running around playing as not Roxas. Or no, wait, you are Roxas in that sequence. You are not uh, Sora. Oh, the, to, to get the money for the train ticket, that is like four minutes. And there's like three different types of minigames you can play. And wait, you only have you to play each play type of minigame once. Confused. I did, in fact, play Kingdom Hearts 2 at one point. We weren't reviewing things yet. <laughs> there's obviously that hilarious Remember, uh, MCP pet sketch. I games before we sketch. started reviewing them. No, I'm confused. Never mind. <laughs> There's the MCP pants sketch about getting the money for the train that's hilarious. But in reality, MC that's... Sir. <laughs> no, I believe... It's it... MCP pants when he's the character on Aqua Teen Hunger Force. <laughs> sure. <laughs> the but, giant I mean, that's... spider. <laughs> MC Chris. Keep going. Sure. But Someday that sequence MC was... Chris is going to punch you in the jugular. <laughs> That sequence was super short, and there were a wide variety of mini games you could play to get that money. 
and you didn't even have to play them all. There was like, here's a whole bunch of mini games. Play some of them for ten minutes. It was like, well, yeah, sure. but you're telling me I'm wasting time. Like, I know I'm wasting time. I'm playing a video game. That's fine. You don't have to overtly explain it to me. And even in that case, that was that is not at all like the rest of the series is. So, as somebody who really appreciates novelty in video games, a 10-minute section that is different than the rest of it, that's not grinding at all. That is, hey, here's some novelty for you. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I like the Kingdom Hearts games a lot, but Epic Mickey 1 was so bad that I, I'm not even going to go in for word 1 of Epic Mickey 2. Until we review it, at which point we'll send copies to everyone on the Nerd Talk Oh team. no! The other thing about Red Faction Armageddon is that you're breaking buildings all the time because there's a ton of destructible terrain, but people are really hard to kill, so the enemies take lots of bullets. I can knock down a building with one shot, but not a person. Yeah, as a I kind of noticed all... that about the original, too. Like... Oddly enough, they appear to be building these, ma uh, making these buildings out of like cardboard and and chewing gum. That works out okay because while it does make the whole world feel like it's made of styrofoam, you often there's a sniper on a building and then you're just like, okay, I'll destroy the whole building and then he'll be killed in the wreckage, and that's entertaining. Yeah, for some reason, Every bullets now and do again. like no damage in the Red Faction universe yet. Hitting someone with a piece of wall from a building, that's like pen amount to hitting them with a uh, an atomic weapon. Unless it is you, which is pretty nice, because if you go inside a building and just start destroying all the walls, and then like four stories of building fall on your head, it basically doesn't damage you. Yeah, it just knocks you just out. Walk away. Yeah, it knocks you out from under the wreckage. It's like, whatever. Now, do we have any other stuff we wish to cover today? We've had we've our show is long enough, so I'll save it all for next time. Okay. Uh, I also want to do more playing of uh, Diana before I go in and talk about her. Oh, we couldn't go an entire show without mentioning League of Legends. Yep, we're gonna do it next time. Ha! All right, so I guess that's it for this week on Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Parasim. And we'll see you suckers at Gen Con. Woo!